This is episode number 112, featuring artist Amy Erickson. Don't want to miss this one. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it plein air. Others say plain air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping. And welcome to the Plain Air Podcast. I'm Eric. It's hard to believe we've done 112 episodes already. I want to thank you for tuning in, and I want to encourage you to let me know who you want to have interviewed, questions you want to hear asked, and also your marketing questions. In case you've not figured it out by now, I'm a little over the moon about Plain Air Painting, and I'm honored that you would allow me to serve you with the things like this podcast, Plain Air Magazine, the Plain Air Convention, and so on. It's a lot of fun to do, and 2019 is going to be a great year. Just to give you kind of a quick overview, the Plein Air Convention is going to be in San Francisco this April. We've got a stellar lineup of faculty, and in the podcast, I'm going to reveal something new that we're going to do at the convention because some people are a little intimidated by going to a big city like San Francisco and worried about parking and worried about painting, and so we've come up with something entirely new. You don't want to miss that. It's in the interview. Also, coming up in June... I'm going to be holding the 10th annual Publishers Invitational in the Adirondacks. Hard to believe it's 10 years. Anyway, it's a solid week of painting together in the beautiful mountains of upstate New York. And if you've not been there, it's pretty incredible. It's not workshops. It's just painting, painting all week together. And because it's the 10th, we'll probably do something a little bit uh, crazy and might be a good time to attend. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, I've also been pretty tight-lipped about this because we gave the members of Fall Color Week a chance to sign up first, but we're going to spend the peak of Fall Color at Ghost Ranch. Ghost Ranch is where Georgia O'Keeffe's home was for many summers in New Mexico. She basically spent the rest of her life out that way at Abiquiu and so on, and it's incredible painting. The painting is endless. You could paint there for a lifetime like she did. Uh, We painted there on the last day of the Santa Fe Plein Air Convention, and it's about an hour outside of Santa Fe. Everybody said they wanted to go back and paint there more, so that's why we decided to do Fall Color Week there. And the trees are going to be this golden color, and the rocks, they just glow with these pinkish-orange lights when the sun hits them. It's going to be a week where it should be still pretty warm and not hot, though, and it's going to be a lot of fun. We sit around the campfire, and they've they've got horses there. You can paint all day, uh, do two or three paintings. We'll probably go to Taos and some stuff like that. Anyway, that's one of the things we're doing this year. Also, I'm not planning an international trip this year like I normally do. Uh, As you know, I've been to Cuba two times. I've taken a group to New Zealand. I've taken uh, a group to Africa, and so Um, This year I decided not to do it because a year and a half from now the kids go off to college and I want to make sure I'm home for them this year as much as possible. So I'm really cutting back on travel. Anyway, one thing we are doing is the annual Fine Art Connoisseur trip, which we always go behind the scenes, visit the museums, meet the curators, go to see art in private homes, uh, behind the scenes, and all kinds of things. This year, we're going to the land of Van Gogh and Cezanne. Uh, We're going to the south of France, Provence, Arles, saint Remy. Uh, Axe in Provence, Nice, Monte Carlo, and uh, we're going to be all around the area. And then as a post trip, anybody who wants to add to it, they can go with us to Edinburgh, Scotland. Now, this is not a painting trip, but it's something that's pretty cool. We call it the Fine Art Trip, and it's with Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. And I always find some time to squeeze in some painting. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to do a little bit of a pre trip painting trip in uh, the south of France, probably Provence. And so that's going to be part of it, although that's not even on the website about it yet. Anyway, there's more surprises up our sleeve for the new year, which I'll reveal once they happen. But if you love art, we're going to have some fun together. Anyway, we'll jump right into this interview with Amy Erickson. And after the interview, I'll answer some art marketing questions in the marketing minute. Amy Erickson, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're really honored to have you on. I love your work. I'm a big fan. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. 
So talk to me about, um, first off, for the, for the sake of the people who are listening who might not yet have a, had a chance to look at your work, uh, try to explain mm-hmm. how your work differs from a lot of what we see. Um, well, there are a few things that I hear a lot in response to my work, and one of them is um, compelling color. I mean, I think that my work does fall into the category of fairly traditional, realistic oil painting. Um, But the brushwork tends to be loose, and I am really interested in color. Um, Another one is the effects of light. Um, So you get strong lighting effects. Another one is an Edward Hopper-esque sense of full loneliness. Full loneliness? Um, yeah, I mean, to me, that's what I see. People people mention him a lot when they look at my work, and I feel like his work does have a lonely quality, but it's not like a, I don't know, to me, a full loneliness is the best way to describe it. Huh. Interesting. I don't see that at all, but I guess it depends on how you view it. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, and, and the, another thing that I hear a lot is that what you perceive in my paintings when you're close up to it versus what you perceive at a distance. Yeah. That there is like, there's a, like the brushwork tends to be um, not tightly resolved. So it reads, it reads more clearly from a distance as far as the subject matter. Yeah. Well, I find your work to have uh, uh, kind of a cross between a, 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 little, a cross between traditional and abstract in the sense that it feels to me like your work has a very strong abstract and, and somewhat modern quality to it, yet it's representational. So it, to me, it feels very, very modern. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank yeah, you, I maybe, studied. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like that. I um, And I am very interested in design. You know, I studied, uh, my, my um, degree is in uh, visual communication design, uh-huh. so very specifically a lot of design classes. And I do think a lot about design when I paint. Well, that's important, isn't it? So let's go through the process. Uh, part part of what we like to do is kind of get to know you and get to know your background. Uh, how did this whole interest in art begin for you? Well, I think it, uh, like I just, like anybody, when you're, you know, two, three, four years old, you pick up color and want to color things in. And I, I just didn't ever really um, put that down. So my, like my, my mom did a lot to allow me to like, she let me draw on the walls and on the backs of furniture and things like that. And she, I started oil painting when I was about six. Oil painting so at six. Really? Just, yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, back then we didn't have, you know, it was very traditional. We used turpentine and linseed oil that we didn't have the, um, you know, safe studio, um, mediums like we have now, you know. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's always been a part. It's always been something that's been familiar to me. Well, so how how did you transform? You're, you're a professional, right? You make your living full-time as an artist? Yeah, yeah. I've been doing that for about 20 years. Have you? So how did you, how did you morph into, mm-hmm. from from childhood painting into that? Did you... Did you always do that? Did you go to school for art? Well, I did not know there was such a thing as art school. I grew up in um, Sunnyvale, which is in the heart of Silicon Valley. And um, my dad was a, a theoretical physicist at NASA, and my mom had taught high school English. And so there, we had a big emphasis on scholastics and um Art was just sort of a side thing. And then, um, so when I started college, I discovered a program that was, you know, this illustration program in, in the design department. And I could not believe my good luck. I, admit, I didn't know there was such a thing you could major in. So um, I majored in that. And then um, I started freelancing. Not immediately when I graduated. I had a couple different design jobs. Um, 
then, you know, it's been, my freelance career has been a mix of some illustration, some design, um, a lot of murals and interior work like decorative painting and color consulting. And then it's just gradually become more and more, you know, fine art. Mm -hmm. So you're still doing a lot of freelance work. Just paint. I mean, just the just the fine art work now. Oh, just the fine art. Okay, mm -hmm. terrific. And where did you go to college? Mm -hmm. I started college at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, uh -huh. and I was there for a year and a half. And then I transferred to Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, mm -hmm. and that's where I studied in the design department. Mm -hmm. They've got a good art department, a good design department there, and a great museum. You know what? I was I was lucky. Yeah. It, it is a really great program. So fast forward to becoming a, uh, a full-time fine artist. What was that transition like and when did that occur? Well, it, I mean, I, like I said, I started freelancing and I was doing kind of a mix of things and I had a lot of, you know, portrait commissions. It was gradual. Um, and, uh, I mean, I would say that I think, I think some, when I started doing the plein air competitions about five years ago, uh -huh. that was really a new chapter because it's such a great platform for you to, um, get your work to a broader audience and meet more people and, um, there, there's just so much activity around those those plein air competitions. Mm -hmm. So uh, that made a big difference as well. I think my first one of those was the fall of 2012. And which one was it? That one was the um, Pacific Northwest plein air, uh -huh. which is in um, in the Columbia River Gorge. Right. And Randy Sexton was the judge that year. Uh-huh. And um, I got a prize, and that was great. And then the next one I did was Carmel, ah. which was a big deal for yeah. me. Yeah, because, it, you know, you look at the list, it was on there, and it's like, oh, <laughs> this will be exciting. <laughs> and now you're on the list, and other people look at you and say, wow, I'd love to be in the same show as Amy. People have said that to me, and it's, I mean, I can, I, it, it, I think it's, I think it's great to be on both ends of that, you know, having, you know, like, there's people that I looked up, up to, and I, I feel like, you know, when people look up to me, I feel like we all embody to some degree this thing that we admire, like, there's, a, um, you know, it, we see it in each other's paintings, but it's like a light source that, comes through us right. and so sometimes we hold it for other people and sometimes other people hold it for us and it allows us to move forward because like it's like you see you see what's important to you in someone else but it's yours because you're the one who's seeing it so it, it'll it allows you to move forward mm -hmm. so you're doing a lot of teaching is that correct yeah yeah i really enjoy teaching so tell me about that. What are, what are the things that you're finding, um, uh, first off, that you're able to teach people maybe that that um, that is unique to you? And then w what are the things that you're finding that people need to work on, uh, maybe patterns of, of problems or issues that students are having? We have a, a, a number of people who listen to this who are relatively new, developing themselves at, mm -hmm. at all different levels. I'm curious about that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. It really is. And I think that, you know, the um, there's so many good workshops that you can take right now. So many really excellent painters teaching. Um, and, and that's not something that I had really a lot of when I was, you know, in that learning. So I had a few, but not as, not, not, not like it is now where you can take from so many different people. But I, I think that one of the most important things you can have as a student is an awareness of learning and where you are and what your comfort zone is and 
and what you're able to absorb. Because I, I, I think it can be a real barrier to students when they get stressed in a workshop because learning can't happen when you're in a state of stress. And I think sometimes people compare themselves to other people or just feel like they need to absorb everything that's happening in the workshop. And um, I think that can be overwhelming. I actually find that I learn if so, I'm in a stressful state, sometimes it, it takes me. No, do you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it takes it takes me to a different place. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's, there's, there's two kinds of stress, right? Right, so, yeah, many kinds I, of I stress. Wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but so as, a, as an instructor, what I, I, I've introduced to my students this idea of flow, where like just imagine a big circle and inside the circle is all of your known skills and concepts. So everything you know how to do and right outside the circle is things that you you're aware of, but that you haven't mastered or incorporated. And then beyond that is the great unknown skills and ideas and concepts and things that are just like distant to you. And not only do you not know them, you don't know about them. So, um, the if you're so so the learning is expanding the circle, right? Like incorporating things that are outside the circle so that they become inside the circle. And um, sometimes sometimes when you're learning, if you reach a state of being overwhelmed, it might be because you're trying to incorporate or do too many new things at once, and you can become. You can it it can be accompanied by a sense of strain or being overextended or like things falling apart. So if you pull back and ask yourself, where, you know, where was I when I knew what I was doing and what's familiar to me, and then incorporate one new thing. Because when we're incorporating one new thing, that's really where we can encounter that sense of flow, where we're challenged, we're engaged, we're really interested in what we're doing. It generates ideas for us. And we're able to integrate that new thing into what we already know. So as an instructor, I can't monitor that for people because you can't really necessarily perceive someone's internal state. But as a student, I feel like that's one of the best things for you to do for yourself because you can't learn 18 new things at once in one day. You know, you can be exposed to a lot of new things. But knowing knowing where they are for you, like whether where, whether it's the next thing for you, because it's something that really holds a lot of energy for you that you are aware of and curious about, or whether it's something that you're like, oh, that that's that sounds hard, or yeah, like maybe one day. But you you definitely have a feeling if it's something that's too far away for you. So I I really feel like the people have the capacity to learn. Um, and it can just really be a very joyful process when it's when it's happening in in that state of flow. So one of the things you talk a lot about or you teach a lot is color and color theory. You have a workshop called mm-hmm. Get Your Color to Sing. Can you talk? Uh, and I know it's hard because you're not we're not visual. You're not you know you're not mixing um, uh, on screen, but. Can you talk a little bit about some of the color theories uh, and, again, maybe some things that you do that we're not accustomed to? Color theory is such a vast and wonderful uh, place to explore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for most of my life, the question that I was most preoccupied with was how would I mix that color? I think that was my primary way of looking at the world. (laughs) How would I mix that? And you know, it the 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 concepts of color theory are fairly straightforward, and um, and I think much more straightforward than color in practice. So the, I think color, the theory of color, you know, understanding that there are three defining characteristics of color: hue, value, and chroma. And then thinking about color in terms of those three characteristics is a really useful way to, to start getting specific about color. Because then, then if you're, if we can all tell when a color is wrong pretty easily. But if you're thinking about it, like, what is wrong with it? Is it the wrong value? Is it too saturated? 
Is it too gray? Is it the wrong hue? You know, does it need to be a different color at the same value, or at, a, at, a, at the same saturation, maybe? So it allows you to think much more specifically about color. And that's one of the basic things that I teach in my color theory classes. And we do a lot of exercises where we intentionally manipulate only one of those characteristics at a time. So we'll start with a, and my favorite one to do is changing hue at a value. And you don't really have to worry that much about saturation, but just go from one hue to another hue without, you have to mix the two of them to the same value first and then mix small increments to get from one to the other. And you end up with this beautiful scale of that changes color, but it doesn't change value. And it's one of the most beautiful things that can happen both in a chart and in a painting because it get, I, I don't know, it's just one of the most pleasant things your eye can look at. So, and I do think that happens a lot in my painting. Um, you know, values are very important. And if you have a simple value structure, um, it works well in a painting. Like that's why values are important because if you get a, a strong, I mean, a simple value structure is what allows a value structure to be strong. So what would you define a simple well. value structure as being? Are you talking about having not a lot of values showing? For instance, you're talking about three values, four values, or do you mean something else? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Few, uh, uh, you know, the fewest number of values that you can th that are legible. So it has to be descriptive as well as being simple. And that's what makes it strong. So well, once you have that structure, then you can use color to divide value from itself. So within that structure, you might, you know, say it's a two value structure, which is really strong. <clears throat> within your darks, well, generally your darks tend to be have more similarity, but if you have a mid, mid range or a lighter range value area in your painting, you can put all kinds of other information in there by dividing it up with color in, in a narrow value range so you don't mess up your value structure. Makes sense. So talk yeah, to it's me. really fun to do. Yeah. So <clears throat> and, and and it it looks like uh, in looking at your work on your website, which is amyerickson dot com, it looks to me like you're doing a lot of palette knife work. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, I think that the palette knife knife has become a way for me to. Um, it, like at a certain stage of a painting, if I if the, the, uh, the palette knife can be a tool that allows the painting to stay alive. Can you talk to me about that? Explain that a little bit. Yes. Do you, do you know? I mean, sometimes when for this is what happens for me when I'm painting. Um, sometimes if sometimes just in the process of laying down the paint, maybe you like work the paint in a way that it doesn't feel alive anymore and you can't really add to it if there's too much paint on the canvas so overly blended but it's somehow uh, either overly blended or just overly worked so that the brushwork has gone has gone mushy just because there's like you've brushed it and brushed it and brushed it yeah. you know mm -hmm. or like you've just yeah it just doesn't have a fresh feeling to it so using a palette knife in that case to like remove paint or move paint around um, is is a way to bring that life back in. So that's that's one of the things I use it for. And the other thing would be just to get a lot of paint down and really fast. So when did this plein air thing start for you? It, it, were you going out and painting plein air before you did this first competition? Uh, had you always been painting yeah. outdoors? Yeah, I like I didn't really I'd never I, I didn't really know very much about like you know un, until you came on there wasn't that that much awareness of it uh, you know as a movement or as a, a general activity that more more people did. So I but I did paint outside 
Um, and in 2003 was when I took a workshop actually in Florence, Italy for a month and we painted outdoors every day. And that was the first time that I had really undertaken it as a serious study. Who did you take the workshop from? So, that was from um, Joe Paquette mm-hmm. of Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. What a great workshop to take. But, yeah, it was great. I learned a lot from him. I, I The first day was a full day of lecture, and I wrote down everything he said. And um, it was it was just really, really, really informative. And while I don't, I don't, you know, like... I don't paint exactly according to his way of thinking all the time now, but it was, it was a really great way to start and a really great structured way to understand a lot of information. It's very inspiring. I think, it, I think um, for me, it can be great to go away. And then you're away from your normal life and it allows you to like, pick up new things and, and your mind is just so much more open when you're traveling. Yeah, that absolutely. was a really great trip for me. So you, after the yeah. Paquette thing, you started doing more and more plein air. I noticed um, on your website that you've got a lot of travel that you've done. You've you've kind of gone all over the place. Can you talk to me about some of your travel and and some of the some of the experiences? Sure. Uh, most recently, I was in China with a group of painters. That was just last November. Um, it was a great trip. There's um, there's some Chinese American painters who are from this area in southern China. Um, Jason Situ organizes it. And um, so there's a, there's a lot of interaction with the local art instructors at both the middle school and high school level. We, we painted outside for the, you know, over a week at all these really interesting locations. And then we had a show in the museum at, in Kaiping at the end of the week. Um, and it was fun just fun to be in such a foreign place and to have it all organized. I, I don't speak Chinese and I didn't need to like the, the whole trip was organized. Um, so that was, that was great. Cause I've been on other trips other times, you know, when I was just on my own figuring it out and that's fun too. <laughs> but at this stage, I'm really glad to be on a trip that's organized. I noticed you traveled to Russia Talk to me about that. Now, Russia is one of my favorite places to mm-hmm. paint. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great trip. That was um, 2017, and that was with another group of artists that has sort of a informal exchange going on. With There's a group of Russian artists, and then there's some mostly East Coast painters who organize, you know, this exchange that goes back and forth. And that, that was a really wonderful trip. I've never been to Russia before. Then where did you go? Um, we went, so so I flew into Moscow and spent a couple days there. And then we were driven like six hours sort of northeast um, to Kostroma, mm-hmm. which is a region and a city. And it's in, it's in the area of Russia that is called the Golden, the Golden Ring. The villages and all, all the towns have those beautiful monasteries with mm-hmm. the gold leaf onion dome towers on them. Yeah, as a matter of fact, and that area the is, Volga River is there. One of the that's one of the uh-huh. areas that the a lot of the students in Russia are told to go to because there's so much great painting there. Yeah, it is, and you know I'm I I follow some of the younger painter well some painters of all ages in Russia, and there's. And I recognize a lot of those areas. There's, they have a lot of, um, in addition to the monasteries and the really grand looking onion domes, they've got a lot of um, hand built wooden architecture, just smaller cottages from the 1800s and 1900s. And they have these elaborate carved frames around the windows, like gingerbreading. It's mm-hmm. really, really beautiful, and they paint them really bright colors. Mm-hmm. The dots. Um, so you, you see those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So. Yeah, it's a great place to paint. I've actually been thinking about putting together a group to go there. Uh, there's been a lot of anti-Russia sentiment, so I'm not going to do it anytime soon, but once we get beyond that, maybe we'll, 
we'll take a group over there and, and do some painting. It's a lot of fun. There's some big changes yes, going on over there. Know, the academic Dasha, which is um, was created by Catherine the Great and is part of the art school system over there, is um, being closed down. It's a tragedy, and oh. uh, it's because they're running out of money. And it's a place where all the students have gone and all the greats have gone. They have a ten, 10 or 20 studios there, and the uh, <clears throat> they, you know they can't afford to keep it up anymore. So it's probably going to go away. Mm-hmm. It's very sad. Mm. Wow, I hadn't heard that. That's unfortunate. So um, mm. I, I understand that you've just been on a pretty major project building a studio. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Tell me about that. Yes, I have. It's at, well, it's at my house. And as it turns out, um, I, I build kind of like I paint, sort of intuitively and with lots of changes, <laughs> which works really great when I'm painting. And the, so the process of building the studio uh, was, you know, you learn as you go. Um, but it's, it's great. It's about uh, 600 square feet, and it has 13-foot ceilings. And... Um, it ha- it has, you know, enough natural light that you can paint from natural light. And, um, yeah, it's, you know, my whole life got, like, in- thrown into disarray during construction. And I didn't have a studio at all for about a year and a half. And um, so now, now I'm in the final stages and getting, getting settled. But I think that's going to take a while. So, it's just because, like I said, I, I keep changing things. <laughs> so are you doing the construction yourself? Well, no. I I did hire someone, you know, a builder to do the the main part of the construction, but I'm doing all the finish work myself. So, mm. I'll, like, they hung the sheetrock and I, everything up to that point. And then since that point, it's all been me doing the finished carpentry and painting. Oh, how fun. And everything else. Yeah, that's a lot yep. of fun, but it's a lot of work. Yep, that's exactly right. So you you have um, you have some philosophies on on uh, learning flow. Can you talk to me about those? Yeah, well, I mean, beyond you know, I think the basics of it are kind of what I described before, and I think the most important thing about it is to build an awareness of what it is of where you are and, and just, just knowing the territory that is you, you know, like knowing, recognizing your emotional state. Some, for some people that can really be important in affecting how you're able to learn and when you're able to learn. Um, Knowing, knowing what works for you if you are stuck, how to get unstuck. I think was one of the most important things because I think it it can be different specifics for different people, but in general, I would advise to find something you know you can do and do it well and do that thing until you start feeling good again, something you can do easily. And it's not necessarily painting, although um, it can be. It could also be, you know, something else altogether. So do you have... uh feelings about how somebody should begin their process. For instance, um, there are philosophies that if you're going to learn plein air painting, you could really, you really should learn painting in general, learn color mixing, get all the hard stuff figured out inside before you ever go outside. And then there are other philosophies that says, it's like, just go for it and do it all outside from the beginning. Huh. Well, I, <laughs> that sounds really hard. <laughs> I guess I would advise if I were if I were advising people I would say what what feels like the best course to you. You know, because if you have if you're if you're compelled by the energy and desire, you just want to be outside and throw yourself into it, then that that's a good course for you. But if you feel more compelled to go in the studio, do some charts, learn the color, you know, learn all those things and take them with you into the field. Um, then I would advise you to do that. And, or some combination thereof, you know. 
I hear so I many stories think, about people who go out and and then give up because they just get so frustrated. What's your oh. best advice for them? Yeah, well, I would say don't give up. Just give up the part of it that's frustrating. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> You know, like that's, that's a really great example, Eric, of like check in with yourself and because, because you're, you're probably doing a lot of things that are new to you. So you want to go back to like, where can I find a point where there's something new that I'm interested in, yet I still have the support of my comfort zone where I know what I'm doing. And then, I, you know, find that one thing that is compelling enough that i I, I can play in with that one new thing without getting overwhelmed. Makes sense. So you're teaching yeah. Yeah. Uh, this year at the Plan Air Convention. Yes. Tell me what you're going to do. I'm going to do a demo. And um, I, that, yeah, I, that's all I know. <laughs> that's all you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's an hour. Well, I actually, right? I, I put you on the spot, didn't I? I didn't really expect you to know, but I was just kind of curious if you had it's something a, special uh, in mind. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a plan. No. Okay. Well, I hope you'll have one before you get <laughs> but there. I'm, re- I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I can tell you that in general, like the first time that I did a demo in front of a class, I remember very specifically thinking to myself, uh, I, I might mess up. And I had like, I had this little twinge of like, that won't work. And then I thought, no, you know what, if, if it doesn't go well, that might be a very instructional demo. Cause most of the time when you're painting, things don't always go in a straight line, start to finish. And I feel like if the demo is this perfect start to finish thing, it's almost, it almost doesn't give the students an in as much. Cause right. it's discouraging like, because you do it so learning, perfectly. Yeah, it just looks it just looks out of reach. So, I so like that's... usually when I demo, I, I I show I try to show more of my process of all the decisions that I make when I'm actually painting. I think it's really wonderful to understand that people who are really good painters also do a lot of dogs, or that they fail from time to time, and that that's part of the learning process uh, because. Yeah, I, I do think there is this sense that everybody out there is, you know, the the faculty at the convention or the the, the top names. You know, this is a sense that they just nail it all the time. And I don't know very many people who nail it all the time. There are a couple probably, but even some of the top top mm-hmm. names, you know, they, they tell me all the time about failures. You know, I heard a, a, a metaphor that I really like for this, which is. Um, on a long aircraft, on a long flight, say it's on autopilot, it means that they're actually off course like 98% of the time because it's constantly correcting. It's like you're going a direction, but if you continued that direction, you wouldn't end up at your destination, so it corrects. And then you're going that direction. Same thing, if you continued in exactly that direction, you wouldn't end up at your destination. So you correct again. So... So overall, you're going the wrong direction almost all the time, yet you end up at your destination because of the ability to correct. Mm-hmm. So if if you're not nailing it, if you're out there and you're working on something and, and you're just getting frustrated, it's just not coming out the way you want it to do, do you just keep working it? Do you step away? What's your process like? I, yeah, I mean, any number of things. Like I, I tend to not... Um, work in frustration very much. Um, if a painting isn't going the way I like it to, I will probably will make a change immediately, um, or you know, scrape it and start over as soon as like it, it's a it's a it's a course correction that happens like you know whenever. I notice that something's not working. So sometimes it means scraping the whole thing off. Sometimes it means getting out a new panel. Well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what you do when we paint. Your colors are so wonderful. I'm looking forward to seeing when we, we paint out there at Chrissy Field and painting the Golden Gate Bridge with the, the sea and the mountains in the background and that beautiful orange glowing bridge. I, I'm going to be excited to see what you do with that. 
and uh, it'll be fun. Yeah, well, I'll have to bring the right color for that bridge, right? <laughs> you can mix it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, see, to see what you're going to do with wine country, you know, when we're out there painting the vineyards, it's going to be fun. So um, look, I'm looking forward to it. So if, if you see me and a, a few other people peeking over your shoulder, you'll know what's going on. Yeah, well, I'm really looking forward to that, too. You know, it, I grew up, like I said, in the in the South Bay, and I've only painted once in San Francisco. So um, it's one of the most beautiful cities um, yeah, I'm and, really and you know, a lot there. of people think that it's all about city painting, and and we're going to be doing some some wonderful landscape painting. We've got some great locations picked out. It's going to be really a lot of fun. We're also doing something new this year. I'll, I'll let you and everybody else in it at, at, at the same time. You know, there's been some negative publicity about San Francisco because of some of the homeless issues lately, and and there's been some people who have been telling us they're a little intimidated to go. Uh, because they're concerned about that. So we actually set it up so if they want to come and s- come to the convention and stay in the convention hotel, then uh, we've developed indoor painting. What we're going to be doing is having taking over one of the big ballrooms and projecting the scene that we're out painting that particular day in video so they can get the sense of the sound mm-hmm. and the motion and the clouds moving and the sun and though it's not the same thing, for anybody who is just a little intimidated about parking or getting around the city, even though you can go anywhere mm-hmm. in 10 minutes with you, with Uber, um, you know, it's it's going to give them an option. So that's going to be kind of interesting. That's the first time we've ever done it. We're also uh, adding more painting locations this mm-hmm. year. So some people don't want to go too far out or take their cars. We're going to have some within walking distance. For instance, Chinatown is right around the corner. Talk about beautiful, bright oh. colors and hanging lanterns and uh, beautiful architecture, different shapes. It's going to be a lot of fun. Wow. That sounds great. Yeah. Well, we'll just stay there longer yeah. and keep painting. <laughs> yeah. I don't see one. <laughs> yeah. You know, I lived out there for 10 years, <laughs> and um, it, it's a painter's paradise. You know, you've got the the giant redwoods not too far out of the city. You've got the Marin headlands, which are these beautiful rolling hills with the sea. You've got the, the big rocks with the uh, ocean waves crashing into them. It's just, you know, there's so much variety. Plus you've got the city if you want to paint the city. So do you have yeah. some, some final thoughts uh, for the people who might be listening, uh, thoughts of encouragement, thoughts of some things that uh, they might want to consider? Um, let's see, I guess, um, as far as encouragement, I think that, um, I think that there's a place where painting can be its own reward, but just the process of mixing color and laying down color can, can be something that makes your life better. And that's what it always has been for me. So I think, I think it can be, I think like bringing it home to, you know, like, what is it that I find beautiful and how can I do that in my work is, is a way to like make it enriching for yourself, expansive for your own soul and also to put more of yourself in your work and, and find joy in doing it. Well, it's been a very, very much a joy to talk to you today and to, uh, to meet you to get a, a feel for you. And, and also um, I just, like I said, I love your work. It's got a lot of unique energy to it. You know, mm-hmm. there are te- there tends to be this this sense where a lot of plein air painting is looking alike. And, you know, that's okay, but they don't have to look all the same. And I think, you know, what's really wonderful is that I'm seeing some really exciting work that you're doing that is, you know, it's, it's, it's really um, much different and magnificent. Oh, thank you so much. That's, that's really nice to hear. Thank you. Well, thanks for being yeah, on the plein air podcast. It's really nice to have this conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks for doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you again to Amy Erickson, and thank you, Amy, for being such a rock star painter. I really love the colors. I really love what you've been doing lately. It's pretty good. You should check out her website, amyerickson.com. It's not A-M-Y, though. It's A-I-M-E-E, Amy, A-I-M-E-E, erickson.com. Well, I guess we should get into some marketing ideas. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. 
author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions, and you can email questions to me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Always seem to get a few every week. Here's a question from Chuck in Atlanta. Chuck says, Eric, I want to sell more, but I'm overwhelmed by all the things I should be doing, and frankly, I'm not sure if I could even ask somebody to buy my paintings. I'm kind of shy. Well, Chuck, you're not so shy that you wouldn't ask the question, so that's a good start. You're not alone, but you have to ask yourself if being shy is serving you or it's getting in your way. I'd say the best thing you can do is start out to seek ways to build some confidence and maybe get you comfortable with selling your own art. Now, this is going to be hard to believe for you, but I was a complete introvert, very shy, very afraid to speak to people one-on-one -on -one and never get in front of a group. And yet today I'll stand in front of thousands of people and be silly and feel comfortable with it. And I learned how to do this by some of the things I'm going to tell you to do. One of the things I'm going to tell you to do, or suggest anyway, uh, to build confidence, join Toastmasters Club. They have one in every town. And Toastmasters really teaches you how to speak in front of other people. I was mortified. I went. I didn't want to go. My palms were sweating. I was just like freaking out that I was going to have to talk to people. And they made everybody kind of stand up and do 30 seconds on who they are and what they do. And uh, that was pretty tough. And then, you know, they just do it every time and everybody gets a chance to speak and they teach you how to do it. And by the end of the time there, I was like, I could have stood up in front of that whole thing and done somersaults. I was, I was so happy with it. So that'll help you. I'd also suggest a Dale Carnegie course on how to win friends and influence people. It's a good way to learn how to be around people. And they also do a sales course. Uh, you might want to take that. So anyway, uh, keep that in mind. And remember, sales is not what it used to be. There, you know, there used to be old school sales techniques that were sleazy. Uh, but you know, today it doesn't have to be that way. You know, some of the car dealers still operate that way, but most of them don't. And so you want to do things that basically are helping people discover what they want, helping them discover how to get what they want. And these uh, courses will help you see the world through a different lens and help you get out of your comfort zone. And we all have to get out of our comfort zone to grow a little bit. If you do these things, you'll pull yourself out to some new behavior and get rid of the behavior that's not serving you. I didn't want to be shy, but I, uh, um, uh, I, I was painfully shy and I just, you know, I didn't know how to overcome it. Somebody suggested these things to me and I did them. And you're very capable of helping yourself if you do something, but you got to take action and do it today. Don't hem and haw around about it. Just do it. Pick up the phone and do it. Next question is from Dawn T in Pasadena, California. I love Pasadena. I'd like to live there. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, I watched one of your video interviews and you talked about the importance of getting out to events and meeting people and how it can help your career. Can you tell me more about that? Sure, I can, Dawn, but first off, Mr. Rhodes is my grandfather. Call me Eric. I'm not big on formalities. <laughs> Uh, have you ever heard of the artist Charlie Hunter? Chances are you probably have. Uh, he's been featured in the magazine. We've uh, got a video coming out with him, and uh, he's been on stage at the Plein Air Convention. Is going to be again this year. Anyway, Charlie's become pretty well, uh, well known, pretty famous these days. Charlie had come to my paint camp in the Adirondacks, the Publishers Invitational. I think it was the first year, about ten years ago. And though he was very outgoing, personally, he was very insecure about his painting, and he had never been part of the plein air community and had hardly even painted outdoors. But because we all bring our paintings in at night, everybody looks at him, we all started noticing how good he was, and he started building confidence. I noticed him too, and I gave him my two cents worth about his paintings, and that I loved him. In fact, I have three of them right here in the studio, the podcast studio, that I bought from him that week. Um, and I'm glad I did because they've gone up in value tremendously. Anyway, not that that's why I buy paintings, but I ended up doing an article about him. He started getting invited to plein air events, and then he started winning awards, and now he's famous, and he's selling a ton of work. His workshops are in high demand, and he's a rock star. And that all kind of started because he got himself out there. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that I did this for him. He did this. He did it by taking a chance, putting himself out there, putting himself at risk, and he built confidence from others. He got feedback. He learned the ropes of the plein air world. He met a lot of people, made a lot of contacts, and made his career happen. Actually, Lori Putnam did the same thing by coming to the first plein air convention. She couldn't even afford to go, but she decided she needed to be there, and she got there. She got noticed, kept coming back, 
Of course, she's very famous now. And I just saw a young guy at our Fall Color Week up in Canada recently. And um, his name was Jed. And Jed came to Fall Color Week. I noticed everybody was marveling about his paintings. And he does acrylics. And they're beautiful. So uh, the event gave him some exposure to the crowd, gave him some confidence, resulted in some things happening in his career. And I even ended up putting him up on the faculty for the acrylic uh, at Plein Air Convention. So... I think it's a pretty cool thing to do stuff like this. Getting out there is really important. It doesn't have to be one of my events. It doesn't have to be a plein air magazine event. It can be anywhere painters gather, but you want to get out there, get to know people, have them get to know your work, uh, help you build your confidence, learn the ropes, and you got to take a little risk to make progress. You'll make friends that will help you along the way because no man or no woman is an island, right? I hope this helps. Anyway, that's not so much direct marketing or advertising advice, but these things are important in, in marketing. So I thought this was a good time to put those questions in there. Um, well, anyway, that's today's podcast. Um, what else? Oh, I do Sunday Coffee on Sunday mornings. It's a blog about life and art and other things, and you can find it and sign up for it to come every week, coffeewitheric.com. And, of course, uh, look me up on Instagram and Facebook. Um, if there's no room on Facebook, just follow me anyway because, uh, you know, that's how you do it. Anyway, this is fun. Let's do it again sometime, like next week. We'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes, and I'm the publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye. This has been the Plan Air Podcast with Plan Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about plein air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.